While national governments are mired in party politics and their own bureaucracy, the cities are bursting with energy, optimism and a sense of resolve. Where nation-states fail, on a city level, many problems such as energy supply, poverty and care for the elderly are increasingly solved in collaboration with citizens. Isn't it high time that these energetic cities are given more power? Shouldn't mayors take matters into their own hands more and turn their cities into administrative centres outside the scope of national politics? Where every citizen, smartphone in hand and with binding referendums, is part of a real democracy. The new city-state. This is what you can expect. I think in this century we're going to flip the pyramid. Uh, national and state governments will be at the bottom uh, and their role and responsibility will be in the act, act in the service of their cities and metropolitan areas. Yeah, it'd be great if the United States Congress did the right thing, but you could make an argument that this is not a bad way to go, right? That cities should lead the chart. They should show the rest of the country that these things work and benefit people. Moet dit land, wat een relatief klein land is, wat in inwonersaantallen minder heeft dan New York, hebben we daar meer dan 400 gemeenten voor nodig, 12 provincies, een grote regering, of kan dat ook anders? This is Backlight. Welcome to the powerful city. In the next few years, we will see massive migration to the cities. It won't be long before more than 60% of people in the West will be living in cities. In developing countries, this will be 80%. Cities are not only growing, they are also becoming more and more powerful. That is the prediction made by Benjamin Barber, political theorist at Rutgers and the City University of New York. He is currently touring the world with his latest widely discussed book, If Mayors Ruled the World. Barber sees cities and their mayors as the new world leaders. Nation states are really becoming increasingly dysfunctional. They are not dealing successfully with their own problems and they're not dealing successfully with the global problems that increasingly in this new millennium we face. I've been thinking a lot about how can we have institutions that work globally, not just locally, and that leads you back to where democracy comes from, the city. Democracy was born in Athens, in Sparta, in Thebes, in the ancient Roman and Greek cities, and so I went back to those cities to begin to look at whether we could find today a hint that democracy still worked best locally. The nation states are defined by their independence and their sovereignty and their borders and their territories, whereas cities are defined by their interactivity, their trade, their mobility, their openness, their entrepreneurship, their creativity and imagination, and above all, their diversity and multiculturalism. So cities are open in where states are closed. Cities connect and cooperate where states compete and are rivals to one another. When we change the subject from states to cities and from presidents and prime ministers to mayors and city councillors, a remarkable thing happens in the character of the politician because the national politician is defined by partisanship, ideology, posturing and high principle. I stand on my principles. The mayor, the city councillor, is defined by pragmatism, prudence, non-partisanship, an unwillingness to declare I'm on the right or the left, and a preference for solving problems. In the American city of Seattle, something historic took place last spring. A close collaboration between the mayor, the citizens, and the business community produced a victory that President Obama can only dream of in Washington's deeply divided national politics. Over the next few years, the minimum wage for the people of Seattle will be more than double the national average, a major step at local level to close the growing gap between rich and poor Americans nationally. This is uh, an exciting moment for Seattle, for the state, and I think for the nation.
Only four months into his term as mayor of Seattle, Ed Murray surprised friend and foe by making good on his ambitious election promise. The minimum wage raised to $15. I felt it was a historic moment. I think that most people didn't think it was going to happen. Uh, many of my close political advisors didn't think it was going to happen. We live in a city that is very, very successful, but we live in a city that is becoming less and less affordable. Um, I grew up in this city in a working class family, and my parents could afford to own a home. That's simply not true today. And so the issue of affordability in housing, in, in areas of education, in, in areas of wage was a, a general theme. Uh, and raising the minimum wage was part of a larger um, uh, campaign theme about how do we create a more equitable city? How do we create economic diversity in this city? And not just simply become a city of the wealthy, not become a city where people uh, come from outside the city to clean our, our hotels and clean our buildings and then go home at the end of the day out, back outside the city. To me, that would become a version of economic apartheid. A year before Ed Murray made raising the minimum wage the central theme of his mayoral campaign, workers in the fast food industry had already started their own campaign. With protests and walkouts, they demanded an income that would put an end to their living below the poverty line. My name is Martina Phelps. I've been working at McDonald's for 10 months and I make 9.47 an hour. My name is Crystal Thompson and I work at Domino's Pizza in South Seattle. I've been there five years now and I'm currently making 9.32, which is minimum wage. My name is Samuel Lalu and I work at McDonald's and I've been working there for 10 months. Thank God I live with my mother or else I don't even know what I would do. A lot of people are just really down and out, especially like working minimum wage. You don't feel like you're really appreciated. You're working for a giant company that gives you the scraps that they can give you possible in this country, in America. Like, it seems like it doesn't make sense. We've been to the city hall and spoke uh, directly to city council members. Um, we've done some um, boycotts. We did the boycott my poverty yeah that was to me that was that was fun that yeah. was that was other than the the march from c tech to see that was huge Super do you think that if we wouldn't have went up there and said anything to them that they would have made a change by themselves it wouldn't have happened the mayor included I think if we didn't get out, strike, do anything, and come up there and actually talk to them personally, do you think that they would have joined, to me, joining the bandwagon? They, would, they wouldn't have joined. They wouldn't have um, been on our side. They wouldn't have even thought about this if it wasn't for the um, airport workers in SeaTac and then the fast food workers in Seattle actually coming to get what's ours. You have um, activists who wanted government to move very fast and at a far more rapid rate of implementing a $15 minimum wage. They wanted, as I said, 15 now. I believe that 15 now would have been very, very harmful to our economy and that we needed to do an approach that phased it in so that we actually helped employees and at the same time didn't hurt employers, particularly our small businesses, which, which make up Seattle. So what I did is I brought together business leaders, leaders from labor unions and leaders from the nonprofits, uh, and we spent the better part of four months negotiating an agreement. I called them in and I said, you have a deadline, and if you do not act, I will act, and neither one of you will be happy with what I put out there. Mayor Murray had to put particular pressure on the CEOs of Seattle's major businesses, who were strongly opposed to raising the minimum wage. But Murray had a trump card. Nick Hanauer, venture capitalist and billionaire. Hanauer is an increasingly important voice in the international debate around the escalating gap between rich and poor. 
During the negotiations in Seattle, where he lives and works, Hanauer tried to build a bridge between the 15 Now movement, which he backed financially, and his friends in the business community. Did you often throughout that period have to sit down with uh, people from the business community to explain why this makes sense? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, so for as long as humans have had capitalism, any time someone made an effort to make the lives of workers better, uh, there have been tremendous objections from capitalists, and they always say the same thing in the same way, which is some form of, if we raise wages for workers, we'll all go out of business, or uh, we'll have to fire everybody, or we'll move, or whatever it is. Um, and this is because even the best, you know, even good uh, meaning capitalists can instantaneously calculate the costs and the risks of higher wages, but not the benefits, uh, even though the benefits may overwhelm the costs. You have to explain to people and get pet people past their fear that rising wages will destroy their businesses or eliminate their profits. People will make adjustments and everyone will be better off. What difference does it make that it came from you, that you told them that? I think it makes a big difference. I mean, I have either founded or been part of the founding of 35 companies across a range of industries. Um, I have a very good track record. Uh, and I'm very, it's very difficult to say to me, you don't know how businesses operate. I'm more successful than 99.99% of business people. Uh, I think I'm more than averagely persuasive on this you don't have to look very far to see somebody who earns, yes, nine thirty-two an hour working for some fast food restaurant. You can't live on that. It's just not, it's not possible. And, um, and so uh, the rest of us pay, pay taxes so that that person can have food stamps and Medicaid, you know, medical from the government and all these other things. It just makes no sense, right? Why shouldn't the company, the very profitable company that that fast food worker f works for, pay them a living wage so that they can, not only don't they need government assistance, but then they can afford to buy things from other companies in our community. It just makes sense. Uh, and this is why things like uh, a higher minimum wage in a city like this are so essential, because without it, you have this ridiculous circumstance where I live like this <laughs> and, you know, 15 or 20 percent of the people in our city can, you know, can barely survive. Fifteen dollars will help. I mean, it may not give me everything I want, but I mean, it'll help lift me out of poverty so I can hopefully go back to school. Maybe when I get 15, I'll be able to afford like a car, my own place. I'm living with my family in a two-bedroom apartment. <laughs> so I'm gonna be able to afford my own place, a car, um, I do want to go back to school for my bachelor's degree too, as well. How long is it going to take before you're going to actually get this $15? Um, two and a half years. There was a time in America where we had the largest middle class on the planet. We also had the best economy on the planet. When all the money is basically moved into the top 1% or so of our economy, you know, those folks buy a yacht, that doesn't stimulate an economy. When you increase average people's wages, they'll go, they go out and they buy a microwave or a TV set. Uh, they invest in their kids' education. They maybe buy that first house. You increase their income, you stimulate the economy. Uh, so I just didn't buy the argument that um, increasing people's buying power by increasing their wages somehow harm the economy. Who will buy the stuff? If, if, if workers don't earn any money, who will I sell my stuff to? And, and, and you know, again, you know, it's all about balancing the amount of value, that, you know, the, 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 the wages of people by split, fairly splitting the value that enterprises create. And when you do that, capitalism works super well. When you don't do that, it's a catastrophe. It's, it's not very complicated. What Seattle has done is basically more than double what the federal minimum wage is. And uh, the president um, has been very interested in this. He's spoken to me about it when I've been at the White House. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of, of Labor um, has spoken with me on the phone about their support of what we've done and their hope that this action by the city of Seattle will help them in their efforts to increase the federal minimum wage. 
Uh, regrettably, you know, we are in a we are in a uh, a, a pretty bad place politically nationally. Um, we have a small group of folks who are have taken control of the Republican Party uh, that's made it very, very, very difficult to do anything uh, progressive. And so Washington, D.C. is pretty frozen. Every other city in the country is going to be like, well, what about us? <laughs> why, why, if, if, if the economy in Seattle doesn't collapse as a consequence of giving low-wage workers a living wage, why wouldn't you do it? <laughs> Why wouldn't you do it? So here we are, as we often are, out in front, showing people that there are interesting things you can do to make your community better, things that involve, I admit, some risk. Uh, but when you do them and things work out, then everybody jumps on board. And, and yeah, it'd be great if the United States Congress did the right thing, but you could make an argument that this is not a bad way to go, right, that cities should lead the the chart. They should show the rest of the country that these things work and benefit people. The great success in Seattle is currently inspiring fast food workers in cities across the states to campaign for a higher minimum wage. So are we indeed headed towards a future where decisive cities are increasingly becoming the starting point for major fundamental change? a future that national politicians can no longer bring about. Bruce Katz is vice president of the Brookings Institution, an influential think tank, and he is former advisor to President Obama's Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. He is co-author of the book, The Metropolitan Revolution. According to Katz, we are on the brink of a true revolution which will turn the balance of power between cities and nation states completely upside down. We were taught from an early age that we lived in a hierarchical system, and I don't think this would be any different in Europe or other parts of the world. Your national government sits at the top. If you have states or provinces, they're sort of in the middle, and then at the bottom of the system are the lowly cities and metropolitan areas. And, and that you know, leads you to believe that um, you're dependent upon resources and rules to just sort of rain down from these higher levels of government. I think in this century we're going to flip the pyramid. Uh, national and state governments will be at the bottom uh, and their role and responsibility will be in the act, act in the service of their cities and metropolitan areas and their prosperity uh, and their ability to be inclusive and sustainable um, communities. And that's right, because at the end of the day, we're a representative democracy. We elect the president, we elect congressmen, we elect state legislators and governors to work for our cities and our metropolitan areas and our communities. So I think the old model of a top-down hierarchy was wrong, frankly. Now, in the past, we used to think about the nation state uh, as the level of government that would deliver solutions. Uh, well, in the U.S., um, the national government uh, has essentially left the building. Um, they are mired in partisan rancor, and they don't seem to be capable, capable of even doing basic things. So what has happened in the U.S. is responsibility for moving the country forward has devolved down uh, to our major cities and metropolitan areas. You're really talking about a revolution more than a moment because you've already identified a whole group of places that are filling a vacuum in our country and are, are really um, inventing a new kind of localism where corporates work with the university, work with government, work with labor. So this is revolutionary in the sense that cities and their stakeholders have collective agency to get grand things done. So the revolution is both leadership to move your city and metropolitan forward, and how we create these collaborative cultures where local government is working closely with business and universities and their citizenry. In the Netherlands, the city of Eindhoven has perfected the model of collaboration between local governments, the corporate world, universities, and the populace, turning it into an extremely successful symbiosis. Eindhoven's local economy is booming, and that has not gone unnoticed in the international media. Forbes calculated that Eindhoven is the world's leading city in the number of patents granted per capita per year. 
In 2011, Eindhoven was named smartest city of the world. Fortune magazine calls Eindhoven a new European Silicon Valley. Rob van Geisel, born and raised in Eindhoven, has been mayor of his city since 2008. With van Geisel at the helm, Brainport Eindhoven grew into a sparkling mix of numerous high-tech companies. As mayor, he was also closely involved in the renovation of the Philips factories, which were once at the heart of the corporation. We lopen here in the old Portiers Loge. Here sat the Portiers, it was a verboden stad. It was also afgesloten with slagbomen. And there are some photos with impressions from früher. Onder andere deze. Dit is het natuurkundig, het beroemde natuurkundig laboratorium van Philips. Een stuk staat er nog van. Hebben we bewaard, een stuk is weg. Maar hier zijn dus de echt grote uitvindingen um, uh, gedaan. Um, tussen 19, ik denk 14 en, um, nou dat zal het zijn, 1960 ongeveer. Daarna is het naar de overkant gegaan. Nou, uiteindelijk is het nieuwe Natlab, natuurkundig laboratorium, gekomen daar waar nu de high tech campus zit. In totaal zit er op dit moment op Strijp S zo'n 1700 bedrijven. Dit is wel een deel van het bruisende deel van, de, van het stadshart. Omdat het, um, hier enorm veel creativiteit samenkomt in wonen. De mensen die hier wonen. De manier waarop er gewoond wordt. De manier waarop er gewerkt wordt. En we laten ook redelijk veel toe. En dit is wat er moet gaan komen. Wat in kleur staat is eigenlijk al uh, gedaan. Daarachter zijn Anton en Gerard. Frits moet nog gedaan worden. Het ziet er allemaal, op zijn zachts gezegd, niet rooskleurig uit daar in Eindhoven. Het beraad waarover ik sprak, heeft tot de overeenstemming geleid dat wij een vermindering van ons aantal werknemers zullen bewerkstelligen. Voor een aantal wat ligt tussen de 35.000 en 45.000 man. A trade delegation from Taiwan, which happens to be a country that took over many of the Philips jobs cut in Eindhoven, is visiting Van Geisel's rejuvenated city to get a glimpse behind the scenes. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to have you here in Eindhoven. And um, well, in the 80s and the 90s, quite a lot of labor went away. It went to South America and to Asia. We lost in two years' time 36,000 jobs. That's a third of all the labor places there on that moment. I know exactly what happened on national level at that time when we here in Eindhoven had huge problems. That was not much. That was not much. We brought our money together. We organized our own community. There was a real power here to get to a new approach. And the national government, we have hardly seen it. We have hardly seen it. What we do is we bring all the stakeholders together. The government, the representatives of the companies, as well from the knowledge institutes. The EuroCities organization. That's the organization of the largest cities in Europe. Named us to have the most, the best collaboration model throughout Europe. So what we did with our triple helix, they said this is the best model in all Europe. As you even the cijfers neemt, dus 110.000 arbeidsplaatsen, 36.000 of an af, and then you have 75.000. Wij zitten nu op 160.000 arbeidsplaatsen. Zo'n kleine 20 jaar later. Waarvan 60.000 gerelateerd aan de high-tech. Dus dat is een enorme boost in die stad zelf van werkgelegenheid. Dat is enorm. We groeien ook heel hard op dit moment. Um, en wat we doen is echt samen. Dus ik ben burgemeester van de stad. Maar ik ben ook voorzitter van de Brainport uh, Development. En we komen met grote regelmaat bij elkaar. We spreken samen strategie af. Omdat we dit instituut zo hebben, zit daar zoveel kennis en zoveel apparatuur. Want zij werken heel intensief samen. Ze brengen de kennis samen. Ze brengen hun apparatuur samen, hun faciliteiten. Daardoor 
gaan die bedrijven kunnen sneller ontwikkelingen tot stand brengen, goedkoper tot stand brengen, het risico spreiden als het moet. Ze maken internationale standaards en dat noemen we open innovatie. Eindhoven is home to the largest high-tech companies in the Netherlands. Multinationals with billion dollar revenues such as ASML, which manufactures machines for the worldwide chip industry. But to avoid ever becoming so dependent on a handful of extremely large corporations like in the Philips area, Van Geisel's Brainport also wants to be a breeding ground for smaller businesses. That way, new innovation and talent will continue to be supplied from the bottom up. Wonderlab, based in the former Philips Laboratories on Strijp S, is an incubator for starting often local technologists, inventors and designers. Here, startups are given six months to develop a plan or a prototype and then see if it is ready to be put to market. Hier in dit gebouw zat, zat natuurlijk uh, Philips en um, er gaan verschillende verhalen de ronde uh, van mensen die hier hebben gezeten. Er zitten nu ook mensen in Wonderlab die vroeger uh, op dezelfde kamer zaten bij, uh, bij Philips. Ik heb zo'n beeld dat hier allemaal uh, rij aan rij mannen met witte jassen stonden om uh, monitoren uh, te ontwikkelen. Je hebt hier een hele innovatieve uh, sector. Je hebt, je hebt heel veel onderzoek, je hebt een universiteit, je hebt de Haartig Campus. Alleen dat, dat staat best wel los van de normale maatschappij. En het idee erachter is eigenlijk dat je die technologie die je dan hier allemaal ontwikkelt, dat je ook toepasbaar moet maken uh, voor uh, de normale burger. En we faciliteren hier start-ups, bestaande bedrijven, maar ook high-tech bedrijven. En wat je eigenlijk hier doet als belangrijkste achterliggende gedachte is uh, efficiënte productontwikkeling. Wij hebben apparatuur uh, gemaakt om 16 huishoudens in één keer te voorzien van gigabit internet. Elke 16 huishoudens die hebben nu zo'n kastje nodig in plaats van zo'n ding voor één huis, uh, huishouden. Ons uitgangspunt uh, zit in de lijn van de e-bike en de uh, e-scooter. Maar dan volledig van de grond af aan opnieuw uh, ontworpen. Dit is zitten, sturen, twee wielen voor. Nou, dan is het een volwaardig uh, vervoersmiddel, ongeveer net zo groot als een fiets. En hij kan vervolgens helemaal automatisch opvouwen. We willen producten maken die tastbaar zijn, die dicht bij de burger staan. Om ook te laten zien wat je met technologie kan doen. En dat wil je niet alleen met ondernemers doen, met, met, met startende ondernemers of met bestaande uh, bedrijven. Maar je wil daar ook uh, uh, jong talent bij betrekken. Je wil daar uh, uh, designers bij betrekken, businessmensen bij betrekken. Maar dus ook burgers, dus ook de, de bewoners hier waar wij dan zitten op Strijp S. Die wil je betrokken maken. Die wil je uh, nieuwe productconcepten laten testen. Daardoor werkt dat gebied dus ook weer mee. Uh, het, zijn, het zijn mensen uh, met een vrij creatieve inslag. Ook de early adapters. Die dit mooi vinden om dat soort nieuwe producten uh, te kopen of te testen. Um, en dat, dat willen we allemaal bij elkaar brengen. As the wonder doctor of Brainport Eindhoven, Rob van Geisel has already come a long way. This was the only region in the Netherlands that continued to grow during the financial crisis, and the future looks bright in the south. But van Geisel has ambitions for this city that go far beyond what he can realize within the boundaries of the complicated bureaucratic relationship between cities, provinces and national government. Ik vind dat wij heel erg beperkt zijn in de mogelijkheden die ons gegund worden om onszelf verder te kunnen ontwikkelen. Dus we zouden veel meer, veel en veel en veel meer kunnen dan dat we nu doen. Als wij de snelheid van de wereld mee willen maken, en die gaat veel harder dan dat we menig in denkt, dan moet de overheid geen remmende factor zijn, maar een stimulerende factor. Dan moet ze mee kunnen doen in de ontwikkelingen die het bedrijfsleven hebben en de kennisinstellingen hebben, wat mensen vragen aan nieuwe ontwikkelingen. Um, en dat wij dus met elkaar dingen kunnen produceren die op de wereldmarkt ook interessant zijn. Ik zie dat we um, veel te moeilijk elkaar het licht in de ogen gunnen. Dus dat er veel te weinig samenwerking is. En een belangrijke oorzaak daarvan is dat we kleine gemeentes hebben... die hoofdzakelijk naar hun eigen belang kijken... en dat iets grotere gezamenlijke belang uiteindelijk daar ondergeschikt aan maken. En dat geeft een enorme rem op allerlei ontwikkelingen. Wij denken dat we door meer bestuur dat we daardoor beter bestuur hebben. En dat we door meer bestuur meer democratie hebben. En dat is echt een misvatting. U moest eens weten hoeveel wij vergaderen. En ik kan u echt vertellen, daar komen heus geen betere besluiten uit. 
Dat is vaak pappen, nat houden, nog een keer uitstellen, nog een keer kijken, omgooien, rekening houden met iedereen. En uiteindelijk komt er dan een besluit uit waarvan iedereen zegt, nou ja, dat vinden we dan nog wel met z'n allen acceptabel. Maar er zit geen kracht in, er zit geen snelheid in. En er zit ook geen doorzettingsvermogen in. Dus meer bestuur geeft meer frictie. Dus, want je krijgt, ja, je moet al die, al die blaagjes, die moeten horizontaal met elkaar bewegen, die gemeentes, provincies moeten daar nog een keer wat over zeggen, nationaal bestuur. En hoe meer bestuur je maakt, hoe meer frictie, hoe meer energie verliest, en je kan maar één keer je energie wegzetten. En dat is eigenlijk waarvan ik denk, moet dit land, wat een relatief klein land is, wat in inwonersaantallen minder heeft dan New York, hebben we daar meer dan 400 gemeenten voor nodig, 12 provincies, een grote regering, of kan dat ook anders? In New York wonen iets meer dan 18 miljoen mensen. Dat is één burgemeester, zes wethouders en daar hebben ze 49 deelraden en ze hebben één gemeenteraad. En daar besturen zij die 18 miljoen mensen mee en dat gaat heel goed. So are cities the answer to the question of how countries can be managed in a simpler, more effective way with less bureaucratic friction? Benjamin Barber wants to go further. He calls for the formation of new city-states. What a city-state or a metro region does is pool the resources, include all of the people who are served by the city's transportation and cultural facilities and trade facilities and the jobs, pools them into a single market that can be taxed, that can be serviced uh, by a urban governance infrastructure. And that, in effect, means governance works bottom up instead of top down. And metro regions are governed from the inside out, not from the top down, and yet together they constitute most of what is the old nation states. Rob van Geisel would very much like to see the city of Eindhoven become part of a city state, together with Rotterdam and Amsterdam. Het is niet meer de tegenstelling tussen de Rotterdamse haven en Amsterdam. Maar het is één stadstaat die gewoon Nederland bestuurt in zijn economisch opzicht. En de uitvoering daarvan in belangrijke mate in de regio's tot stand brengt. En daar ook veel verantwoordelijkheden naartoe brengt. En dat zijn dus logistieke processen, eh, distributieprocessen. Dat zijn financiële, dienstverleningsconcepten in Amsterdam. En bij ons zit dat technologie. Het is redelijk complementair. En dan wordt het dus belangrijk dat we die verbinding in Nederland maken. Ieder vanuit zijn eigen kracht. De Amsterdamse regio, Rotterdamse regio en wij. En dan gaan we niemand vergeten. Want dan nemen we ook de verantwoordelijkheid ook wel om de verbindingen in Nederland te maken. Met Twente, waar ook heel veel technologie zit. Dan krijg je ook zoiets rondom voedsel met Wageningen. Daar zit ook zo'n soort internationale pijler. Die ook een aantal van die gebieden voor, uh, probeert te binden. Is het gevaar niet hiervan dat je eigenlijk alle sterke delen van Nederland bundelt... maar dat de zwakkere delen dan eigenlijk gewoon in het, in het, in het, over, in het overige groepje komt. Maar daar ben ik het ook helemaal niet mee eens. Want ik vind, kijk, als het allemaal op elkaar moet gaan lijken... wij hebben er echt voor gekozen, en ik denk heel succesvol... om de technologie- en designregio van Nederland te zijn. En misschien wel van Europa. Daar hebben we een bewuste keuze voor gemaakt. We hadden ook andere dingen kunnen doen. Um, en ik denk, als ik naar Drenthe bijvoorbeeld kijk... Dat heeft geweldige kwaliteiten. Groningen, Oost-Groningen. En Groningen, daar zit op het gebied van de medische uh, kennis, hè, dus rondom de universiteit, et cetera. Uh, en ze proberen te koppelen ook aan energie, zitten daar ontzettend mo mogelijkheden. Maar je moet, dus, je moet dus iemand in zijn kracht zetten en niet alles gelijk proberen te behandelen. A city-state such as Rob van Geisel would like to see in the Netherlands has already been in existence for centuries in the North German harbour city of Hamburg. Since the year 1241, Hamburg has been a member of the Hanseatic cities, a trade confederation between cities along the coast of Northern Europe. As a city in today's Germany, Hamburg also forms its own federal state. We're in the exact center of the building here, and this room is very important for the history of Hamburg. We can see here why Hamburg is so proud of being a city-state. Hamburg sees itself in the tradition of the old city-states. We start with the city of Athens there. We've got the complete Acropolis in the background, and the next one is the city of Rome. Then we stay in today's Italy, 
Venice used to be a powerful city-state. The Doge Palace uh, is in the background. And last, we can see Amsterdam. The Malay lady in the front empties uh, wealth into the country that symbolizes the colonial wealth. We are on the town hall square, right in front of the main entrance to the town hall. This is for where, for example, the emperor was visiting Hamburg. He was coming here with his old entourage um, and about to go inside the town hall. One person is missing though. This is specifically for the city-state of Hamburg. It has this particular uh, tradition that the mayor does not meet his guests on the front door. He's waiting inside, upstairs. This is the place where the mayors of Hamburg are receiving the dignitaries and they always do it here. Even the kings are coming upstairs. And this is a long tradition of the old independent city republic. And what does that say about the attitude the city, that, that the city of Hamburg has towards the rest of the country and the rest of the world? This is a tradition which uh, is of big importance because the city of Hamburg was always very proud of being not influenced by kings and dukes and other persons. And so it shows this special attitude of the city and the long tradition of being an independent city republic. Olaf Scholz has been mayor of Hamburg since 2011. Before, as SPD general secretary, he was a powerful politician in Germany's national parliament. But Hamburg, his city-state, has autonomic power over many policy issues, independent of Berlin. It is the lender, the states in Germany, which are responsible for um, all the law sector, which are responsible for police, which are responsible for education, for universities, for instance. And being a city-state, that means that we are able to influence this and have not to ask others about these questions. And uh, we are taking our own, we are raising our own taxes. And this gives us also some independence in discussing about our political ideas and about our economic expectations. And being a city-state, that means that we have our own parliament, which is called the Bürgerschaft. We have our cabinet, which is the Senate, with the senators, which are more or less ministers. And the Bürgermeister, the mayor, is uh, also one of the minister presidents or prime ministers of uh, one of the 16 states in Germany. For us, it is not only a chance to be more effective in questions of bureauc bureaucracy, but it's also a chance to react to new developments. I think the big cities are a sort of laboratory of modern times, and uh, it is necessary that they have old instruments to react to questions that have to be solved. As mayor, Schultz has already achieved a great deal, for example, in the field of integration, and when it comes to his election promise to build thousands of new houses in this fast-growing city. But how did the citizens themselves benefit from Hamburg's autonomy as a city-state? Ich bin stellvertretender Vorsitzender des BUND in Hamburg. Wir haben seinerzeit die Kampagne ins Leben gerufen, weil wir der Überzeugung sind, dass die Energieversorgung in Hamburg auch wieder in Hamburger Hände gehört und nicht in die Hände von Konzernen. Der BUND hat diese Kampagne mit ins Leben gerufen, weil wir der Überzeugung sind, dass die Energiewende nur gelingen kann, wenn die Netze in öffentlicher Hand sind. Die Hamburger Stromleitungen, das zweitgrößte städtische Netz in Deutschland. Anfang des Jahrtausends privatisiert, der schwedische Energiekonzern Vattenfall war seitdem Eigentümer. Zuletzt machte das Unternehmen im Schnitt 20 Millionen Euro Gewinn pro Jahr. Das ist nun vorbei. Nach zehn Verhandlungen kauft die Stadt ihr Netz zurück für rund eine halbe Milliarde Euro. Die Stadt Hamburg bekommt wieder ihr Stromnetz und sie bekommt das Fernwärmenetz. Sie kann die notwendigen Investitionen, die für auch die Energiewende in Hamburg notwendig sind, jetzt allein auf den Weg bringen. Ursprünglich hatte die Stadt gar kein Interesse an einem Kauf. Eine Initiative hatte ein Volksbegehren gestartet und am Ende gewonnen. Seitdem muss sich der Hamburger Senat bemühen, Betreiber des Netzes zu werden. 
Ja, wir waren sehr froh. Es war eine schöne Party. Ja. Ein ganz besonderer Triumph war auch, es gab eine Wahnsinnskampagne einer ganz großen Koalition der Handelskammer, der Wirtschaft, ja. der großen mhm. Parteien, alle gegen die Volksinitiative. Mhm. Und wir haben trotzdem gewonnen. Das ist ein Riesenerfolg. Also diese 51 Prozent sind in Wirklichkeit 80. In the city-state of Hamburg, referendums are binding, making them much more powerful than in other cities. Mayor Schultz, the Senate and Parliament were opposed to buying back the electricity grid. But in a binding referendum, the people's will became the law. What did the mayor think of all of this? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he was not amused. Also, der Bürgermeister war sicherlich von dem Ergebnis nicht besonders erfreut. Er hat von Anfang an die Linie vertreten. Das ist viel zu teuer. Die Stadt kann sich das nicht leisten. Und außerdem, damit können wir überhaupt nichts erreichen in Sachen Energiewende. Das war seine Position. Wir haben es offensichtlich geschafft, mit unseren Argumenten, die, Argumenten, die dagegen waren, die Bevölkerung davon zu überzeugen, dass es doch anders ist. Die meisten unserer Kampagne waren der Meinung, dass die Sachen, die eben zur Daseinsfürsorge gehören, und da gehört Strom ja auch zu und die Wärme, dass das einfach nicht in private Hand gehört, wo auch finanzielle Interessen eine Rolle spielen, sondern dass das einfach in kommunale Hände gehört. Natürlich ist das Netzgeschäft auch ein gutes Geschäft. Vattenfall hat immer erhebliche Gewinne nach Stockholm transferiert und E.ON ebenfalls in die Konzernzentrale in Düsseldorf. Warum soll das nicht die Stadt bekommen? Und weil sie uns das hier hinstellen, obwohl wir eine Volkspetition dagegen gehabt haben. Die Menschen haben sich ausdrücklich dagegen ausgesprochen, hier äh, Kohleabbau und äh, hier äh, 8,5 Millionen Tonnen CO2 pro Jahr, mehr als das Doppelte von dem, was unser Verkehr ausstößt. Deshalb sind die Leute stinkig auf Wattenfall. Das kann doch, kann doch kein, kein Partner für die Energiewende sein. Die Energiewende geht einfach nicht mit den privaten Konzernen. Die haben andere Interessen. Und wenn wir sie wollen, und die Stadt wollte das, dann müssen wir halt sehen, dass wir wieder die Hoheit über die Netze bekommen. How did Aeon in Vattenfall, what was their reaction to this? Sure. Ich weiß nicht, ob die Pressestelle an diesem Abend geöffnet war. <lacht> Wij vieren hier vandaag dat Eindhoven 70 jaar geleden bevrijd werd van een zwarte bladzijde uit onze geschiedenis. Als burgemeester, als burgemeester ben ik trots op jullie, op jullie betrokkenheid die we samen voelen bij de veteranen die ons hebben bevrijd. Rob van Gijzel was a member of parliament in The Hague for the Dutch Labour government for 12 years. In 2001, he left national politics, never to return. I had a long period as a member of the government, and I was also proud of it. I did it with a lot of love and pleasure. But if you're in it, you know that it's your world. This is necessary. Laws and rules and so on, on national level, should be absolutely made. But it goes very far away from the current reality. Maar ook ver af omdat die processen duren zo lang. Als er in de stad iets gebeurt, dan heb ik gewoon, nou ja, redelijk snel gaan we dat dingen doen. Maar hier ben je twee jaar bezig met een wetgevingstraject. De vraag is hier centraal, waar is de overheid voor? Is de mens, zijn de mensen er voor de overheid of is de overheid er voor de mensen? En dan is dus de volgende vraag, waar hebben mensen, bedrijven, cultuurinstellingen, waar hebben die nou behoefte aan? Waar, hoe moet dat er, nou, dan kan ik heel snel het antwoord geven. Die hebben vooral behoefte bij dichtbij. Bij dichtbij dingen organiseren, zodat het ook hanteerbaar wordt. Want schaalniveau is vaak een belemmering om tot goede oplossingen te komen. Als je dat nou het uitgangspunt is, probeer het dan ook een beetje dichtbij te organiseren. En dat brengt dan, want ik zie wel die discussie over Europa. Dan zeggen ze, ja, Europa beslist veel te veel. Daar ben ik voor een deel ook nog mee eens ook. En dat is te ver van, van ons bed af. Maar hier beslissen ze ook heel veel. 
En dan gaan ze dingen decentraliseren en vervolgens komen er allemaal voorschriften bij hoe wij dat dan moeten doen. Als wij nou de beste overheid zijn, hè, dus de lagere overheid, als die nou de beste overheid zijn om dingen te organiseren, zou het dan ook niet het beste zijn om te bedenken hoe het dan zou moeten? Met de partijen die daar de meeste deskundigheid over hebben over hoe dat dan zou kunnen. En de mensen voor wie we het ook het uiteindelijk doen. Voorheen was het natuurlijk zo, nou ja, de politiek die werd gekozen, de raad, en de raad ging erover discussiëren, we gaan het zo doen. Die samenleving van boven naar beneden is in mijn, in mijn wijze van zien definitief passé. What within this new society will be the balance of power between cities, nation states and the rest of the world? In Amsterdam, mayors and city leaders from all over the world have been asked to convene by Benjamin Barber. Barber feels there is an urgent need to formalize the already growing power of mayors and their cities, and to join their collective power in a global parliament of mayors. Within this newly formed parliament, cities should start making important decisions together outside the realm of nation states. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, friends, um, let me give the floor to the wonderful organizer of this conference. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, Benjamin Baba. I believe it is cities and their mayors and their citizens and their civic organizations and their <coughs> private sector businesses who share public-private partnerships. I believe it is here that we have an opportunity to once again find ways to solve political problems and make democracy work. Not just with cities one by one by one, but with cities when they cooperate and work together across the borders that their problems have made irrelevant. Because when it comes to Ebola, when it comes to terrorism, when it comes to global markets and finance, when it comes to immigration, when it comes to the new pandemic diseases, when it comes to technology, the borders that separate nation states are irrelevant. And mayors know it. They know they have to deal across those borders to begin to deal uh, with those subjects. So I hope we will explore the possibility of forging a new governance revolution by organizing a global parliament of mayors that formalizes the important informal work already taking place among mayors around the world. I hope we will emerge with an action plan for moving forward. That is our hope. I thank all of you for being willing to go on this adventure to partake in what could be a significant governance revolution that might make it possible for our children and grandchildren to live in a sustainable world. Thank you very much. Hot town, summer in the city, back of my neck getting dirt and gritty. Then down, isn't it a pity? Doesn't seem to be a shadow in the city. All around, people looking half dead, walking on the sidewalk harder than a matchhead. Actually, we can do a selfie. <laughs> If I see this in the film, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> ik hoop dat Ihnen dat video gevallen had. Klikken Sie hier om dat empfohlene video aan te zien. Bitte abonneren Sie onze kanaal om updates over VPRO-Doc te erhalten.